Salam alaikum. Hello, everybody. I apologize for the late start. We had a few technical problems, um, but we are uh, we are happy to to be with you and to begin. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be um, with you here, continuing the series that we are doing with the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Um, this is the fourth um, episode in that series. Um, and today we'll be discussing the very important topic um, of the relationship between the United States and Israel, Israel's most important um, uh, international uh, relationship by some distance, and a crucial part of a crucial pillar of Israel's uh, security doctrine. Um, we are delighted to have with us Professor Eitan Gilbar, uh, an expert on US Israel relations, international communication, and public diplomacy. Uh, he was the founding head of the School of Communication and the Center for International Communication at Bar Ilan University. Uh, he's also been a senior fellow at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy and was a senior research associate at the Besser Center for Strategic Studies. Um, he has a, an MA and a PhD from Harvard. Um, he's been a pro visiting professor at many top universities in the United States and Europe. He has a very, very long CV, which I'm not going to go through because we're already running late and I really want to get into the content of the conversation um, but take my word for it he has a very impressive bio um so uh professor gilboa thank you for joining us apologies for the late start um let's start with this um now when we initially had this um when we initially started this series um or planned this series i should say uh the u.s israel relationship was an important topic because it's always an important topic but now we're having this conversation in the wake of the events of October 7th. And suddenly it's a very, it's a very different question because we're dealing with the, uh, the uh, aftermath of October 7th and uh, President Biden's really extraordinary um, uh, demonstration of support, both in his public statements and his um, uh, military uh, support or offer of military support and, and the very visible support of the two aircraft carriers, um, you know, into the Mediterranean. Um, nevertheless, um, there is a um, uh, a background of some tension between the White House and um, the present Israeli government going back from before uh, uh, October 7th in the midst of the judicial reform protests and everything else. Um, so perhaps you could just give us as a starter your assessment of where things stand in the um, in the US Israel relationship today. Yes, I think you are quite right. Uh, we have to distinguish among different phases uh, of the war uh, until the humanitarian pause, uh, we've had the war. Now we are in a humanitarian pause, not a ceasefire, humanitarian pause. Uh, Israel says it would resume a full-scale war after uh, the uh, humanitarian pause ends and uh, Israel could get as many hostages back uh, as possible. There is still much agreement about the goal. The goal is to remove uh, Hamas from Gaza, to free Gaza of Hamas. Uh, there's much consensus about it. Uh, even in the Arab world, everybody wants to see Israel liquidating Hamas's military uh, and governmental power. Uh, there are some uh, disagreements about uh, the humanitarian pose and perhaps also about the day after. Uh, the humanitarian pause. So the United States is telling Israel time and again that um, they would like to see as much as humanitarian assistance as possible. Uh, they are concerned about the concentration of about less than two million people in a very uh, in a very uh, narrow area in the, in southern Gaza and. Uh, and this has been an American uh, military doctrine since uh, the global war on terror. Uh, keep humanitarian assistance as, uh, as uh, wide as possible to enable a military operation as uh, strong as possible. 
Uh, and, Professor, um, Gil Professor Gilboa, sorry to interrupt. Your there's a problem with the with your video. We can hear you fine, but the, we can't see you. Okay, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We have too many difficulties these days. Yeah, we day. had a few difficulties. It, it may it okay, may be let me, let me, let it me may see be my... that we'll have to continue like this. But let's see. No, no. I let, let let's let's uh, let's let us try again. Okay, okay. just a second. I'll turn it off and I'll start it again. Okay. Because we are using we are using our. And now phone. we can see you. Now we can see you. Really? Yeah. So I'm simply I'm simply brought it closer. So okay, I'm not responsible for my picture because I cannot see myself. So okay. Well, you look fine. <laughs> but we can. The most important thing is we can see you. Okay. So it's it, it, and now now you can see me. Yeah. So this is strange. Okay. So I I, I would like to continue by saying that. Uh, so uh, the United States uh, would like Israel to continue with the humanitarian assistance. This sounds a little bit, a uh, little bit absurd, because um, Israel is required or demanded uh, to uh, provide humanitarian assistance uh, to Gaza uh, uh, without any uh, demand, any reciprocal demands from Hamas. Uh, to offer humanitarian concessions. But the answer is very simple. Uh, Hamas, uh, Sinwar, couldn't care less about Gazans. From his perspective, uh, all the Gazans could die. Uh, he uses uh, civilians as human shields. Uh, so uh, uh, telling Sinwar we would uh, terminate uh, humanitarian assistance if you do not do one, two, three, would not work. And also the U.S. is very much concerned about, uh, about um, uh, securing legitimacy for, uh, for the war uh, at the international arena and thinks that this is going to be a little bit problematic. And there is uh, there's also uh, some differences uh, between Israel and the United States on the day after, but I think we could discuss it later. Right. Yeah, we'll, de we'll definitely get to that. And I'll just say to our audience, please write questions into the into the chat, uh, the chat at the bottom of the screen, and we'll we'll get to those questions later. Um, OK, so um, we've talked about some of the some of the differences in, in the um, in the general uh, uh, in the general sort of execution of the war. Um, but what 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 would you say? How would you define America's strategic interest in this war beyond just its support for Israel. Yes, uh, the American interest uh, in the war uh, has not changed. Uh, President Biden has said several times, uh, this is not just a war uh, uh, limited uh, to Gaza, to Israel and Gaza. It has many regional and international repercussions. Uh, so uh, the first interest is to uh, to uh, show what an alliance is. Israel is considered uh, one of the most important U.S. allies, obviously in the Middle East, but also in the world. And uh, friends and enemies uh, alike uh, watch, are watching uh, how the United States is helping Israel. This, this is number one. I mean, two, uh, the interest of the United States is to eliminate Hamas because Hamas has always been a force against war, against peace. It has always uh, supported war. It never supported uh, the peace, pro the, the um, Oslo peace process, uh, always carried out terrorist attacks, and it is uh, connected with Iran. Uh, this connection with Iran is important because uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, Hamas uh, 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 would survive, then it would be considered uh, a major victory for Iran uh, that is threatening uh, Arab countries, uh, uh, allies of the United States, Israel. And uh, there is also uh, a more uh, general global uh, context, and that is uh, the connection between Iran, Russia, and China. Iran, Russia, China, even Iran. Iran signed in February 2021 a major agreement with Iran. Uh, it is economic as well as strategic and military. And so, uh, so the other, this is the evil axis uh, 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 facing uh, or confronting 
uh, the U.S. axis, which includes uh, Israel, but uh, uh, Arab allies of the United States. And so, uh, the, the, so the test here is also for uh, American ability uh, to maintain uh, Western as well as regional uh, interests. We also know that uh, the, uh, the uh, Hamas's uh, atrocities carried out on October 7 were connected with uh, Iranian's attempt uh, to subvert uh, the normalization, the, the, uh, the pending normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And so, uh, and so, uh, uh, so the implications are uh, bilateral with Israel, regional, and global. So, I mean, Israel and the United States share um, share a lot of um, a, a, a number of interests, but there seems to be certainly since the since since President Biden uh, came into office, there has been a difference between Israel and the United States on the issue of Iran, at least in terms of how to prevent it. We can, if we assume that, if we take the Americans at their word, that they also would like to prevent Iran going nuclear, there certainly is a difference of opinion in how to how to go about that. And I'm wondering whether, um, despite the um, very welcome uh, response from the Americans uh, in relation to Hamas and also in terms of deterring Hezbollah, um, whether the differences over Iran nevertheless um, point to a point to continued tension between the Biden administration and the Israeli government. I certainly hope that the uh, Biden administration has uh, drawn uh, the proper lessons from the from Hamas's uh, atrocities uh, of the Obama administration, Trump, and as well as Biden, uh, failed uh, in stopping Iran's uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, they uh, they attempted to do it by rewards. Uh, the two the two thousand fifteen uh, nuclear agreement by by exiting the agreement. This is what Trump did. And Biden attempted to resume negotiations with Iran in a very in a very strange way. It all failed, and obviously, uh, it failed the cause. I think of American misreading of uh, Iran's uh, conduct, behavior, lying and cheating, and and um, subverting and undermining all attempts by Europe and the United States. So I think that Europe still believes that um, that. Uh, negotiations with Iran could produce uh, a reasonable nuclear agreement. I don't think so. Uh, I think the United States uh, should know now that the only way to deal with Iran is by force, because Iran are using proxies, her proxies in the Middle East, from uh, from uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, then you have the pro pro Iranian militias in Iran and Syria which have been attacking United States bases and forces, like uh, almost 60 attacks so far, with very little American uh, military reprisals, uh, all the way to the Houthis in, in Yemen that uh, have been launching uh, missiles and uh, drones uh, toward Israel and also attacking uh, um, uh, Israeli supposedly owned uh, ships uh, in the Red Sea. So uh, it seems to me that it should be clear uh, to the United States, and this is not only what Israel is telling the United States. All American Arab allies, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Gulf Emirates, are telling the United States that Iran is the source of terrorism, violence, instability uh, in, in the entire region. And I think it's about time uh, to deal with the, with, with the head of the snake, rather than uh, trying to uh, accommodating, negotiating. Mm. Uh, uh, the United States is a little bit worried about using force, uh, another use of force in the Middle East. Um, President Biden withdrew from Afghanistan in a bad way. Uh, it seems that the American public uh, would not support any serious military engagement uh, with Iran. 
But I think this is this is uh, this is why uh, defeating Hamas, eliminating Hamas, uh, is is crucial for also sending a message to Iran that they are not going to be successful in messing up uh, Middle Eastern uh, American uh, allies. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's very uh, that's obviously very critical for us. Um, one of the big stories, if not the big, if not the big story in Israel over the last two or three days, is the release of some of the hostages. Um, and the United States, of course, has played a major role in those negotiations. Can you speak to that? Can you tell us something about the American, the American role in that? Yes, uh, the United States uh, shares. Uh, that interest as well with Israel. Uh, Israel from the beginning said that um, uh, it has two major uh, strategic goals. One is uh, to liquidate Hamas and the second one is to free the hostages. Uh, sometimes uh, the two go and hand in hand. Sometimes they contradict each other, yeah. but they obviously uh, suddenly uh, 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 sought uh, negotiations over hostages only because of Israeli military pressure. Uh, so uh, the United States has been uh, heavily involved uh, in uh, in getting the negotiations and the agreements to free hostages. Uh, they divided the work, so to speak, with Qatar and Egypt. Uh, Qatar and Egypt uh, were su were supposed were assigned. Uh, to apply pressure on Hamas, the United States said it would apply pressure on Israel, and this is how they divided the work. But I should say that this is asymmetric type of negotiation because Qatar, even in Egypt, but certainly Qatar is not an honest broker. Qatar has been funding and helping Hamas build uh, that military, enormous military infrastructure in Gaza. And so, so uh, 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 Qatar is representing Hamas uh, as much as um, serving as an honest broker. And I think that Egypt has been playing uh, a much more significant role. But obviously, Biden himself is involved and uh, is uh, representing Israeli interests, helping Israel to secure uh, uh, to secure the number and the category of uh, of uh, hostages, women and children, uh, one has to understand it. It is outrageous uh, to for for uh, for Hamas uh, to hold babies and women and children and old people. Uh, I don't think it, it it has ever happened. It shows the cruelty uh, of of Hamas. And uh, this is not enough emphasized and not enough dealt with uh, in the international media. Uh, but I think that um, so so uh, the U.S. assistance uh, is important and it's also important uh, for the next phase because at one point of time, Israel will have to resume the full scale war against Hamas. Hamas is trying right now, these days, to extend the humanitarian pause as much as possible. It wants to convert the humanitarian pause into a permanent ceasefire. And this is something that uh, Israel will have uh, to coordinate with the United States. Uh, uh, once all the women and the children are released, uh, Israel uh, will have to, re to, uh, to, to resume the full-scale war against Hamas, especially in the south and southern part of Gaza, more specifically at the Khan Yunis um, uh, area, because this is where Sinwa and his uh, uh, his chief uh, uh, chief commanders uh, are at, and I hope that um, uh, that we can that Israel can do it. Say in a few more days, like four or five uh, more days. Um, uh, I don't think that Israel could uh, could uh, extend. Uh, that humanitarian pause beyond the total of, say, 10 days. Hmm. Wow. Um, before I get to the next question, I'm afraid your image has disappeared again. <laughs> your picture's disappeared again. Okay. Let, let me see what I can do with that. Eight, I think last time you just, it was, you just moved. <laughs> it just seemed to, it seemed to uh, reappear when you moved it, but we'll see. 
I have no idea why yeah. it is happening, but let oh. me see if I can do something about it. Okay. Just one second. Uh, may I may have to do with if if we yeah if we if we just if there's no image then we'll just we will just hear your hear your wise words without uh, yeah I, I, it is I don't mind anything. but let me see if I've done something let me see yeah you're back. Now? you are back yes I'm back yeah okay let me see because I'm playing here I I, I did not expect to use my phone for this this is the yeah we had a problem there. yeah we had a the the audience should know we had a problem and we had a problem uh, with the uh, with the professor's computer beforehand. So, but we, uh, my picture is okay now. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine because I don't see the picture, so I have no, yeah, I, I have no idea. Take your okay, why don't take you my word for it. Um, so thank you for that answer. I, I'll, I'll ask one more question, then I'll then I'll get to some questions from the audience. Um, one thing we haven't discussed is the is how domestic American politics plays into this because. We we see that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of dissension in the ranks. There's a lot of there are a lot of members of the Democratic Caucus, especially on the left of the party, the, the so-called Squad and others, who are very much against uh, Biden's strong support for Israel, and that extends also, I think, to the to to, to younger voters uh, on the left. And we see in the polls that Biden is now slipping behind Trump. Uh, with the election a year away. Um, so I, I, I guess a sort of two part question. One is um, whether you think that his support for Israel could actually have an effect ultimately in the in the 2024 elections. And two, whether if it continues like this, whether it might lead him to uh, to move away from his support for Israel because of his domestic political concerns. So, um Yes, I think that the polariz political polarization, both in the United States and Israel, are uh, not helping uh, uh, the war and in general, American-Israeli relations. Right now, there is a major challenge uh, to uh, American special aid, military aid to Israel. Uh, President Biden um, uh, submitted to Congress a package deal, including uh, substantial military aid uh, to Ukraine, to Israel, $14.3 billion uh, for Taiwan uh, and for uh, uh, some improvements uh, in the border with Mexico. And uh, Biden uh, insi is insisting on uh, getting congressional approval for the whole package. Uh, the House of Representatives under Republican uh, control separated uh, the package. Uh, they voted for the aid to Israel and transferred the issue to the Senate. Uh, usually when there are differences between the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, they form a committee uh, to discuss the differences and to come up with um, with an agreed uh, solution. But because of the polarization and because of the presidential elections that had, uh, have already started, it became very difficult. There is not much time. Uh, there are only three weeks uh, before, uh, before the uh, Christmas uh, recess. Uh, and, uh, Biden said, uh, that the Senate would not approve uh, just aid to Israel. He also said that he would veto such, uh, such uh, a deal. He wants the package deal uh, as such uh, mm -hmm. to be approved. So we see how the polarization and the elections are damaging uh, yeah. this military aid to Israel. Uh, uh, this aid is crucial because uh, uh, much of it, if not most of it, goes to American uh, military industry uh, to produce or to, uh, to uh, supply Israel with munition and military equipment um, uh, for the war. Uh, Israel has been receiving uh, uh, weapons uh, that it had not had for a long time, uh, yeah. new type of weapons, uh, precision kind of weapons. Uh, 
so I think that um, this is problematic. Uh, I hope that uh, Netanyahu would uh, contact uh, his Republican um, allies in Congress and tell them that they have somehow to reduce, uh, to reduce the opposition uh, to the aid uh, to Israel. Uh, this is what Biden expected of Netanyahu to do. Uh, so far, it has not worked. And I hope that, um, that uh, this aid uh, will be approved in the next uh, two weeks. Okay, yes, we certainly, we certainly hope so. All right, um, I'm going to turn now to quest some questions that have come from, from our audience. Uh, there was a question from Leon who asked about Hezbollah and specifically whether, whether the U.S. would be interested uh, or see it as an interest to, to act uh, to remove Hezbollah or maybe help Israel to remove Hezbollah in the same way as we are looking now to remove Hamas because of the threat that Hezbollah poses to Israel and the threat it poses broadly to Middle East uh, stability. Yes. Uh, so, uh, first of all, the United States um, uh, was telling Hezbollah anyone not to intervene in the war. Uh, President Biden uh, used the phrase don't, don't, don't. Right. And he backed up his statements by sending uh, an aircraft carrier uh, to uh, to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and another one to the Arab Persian Gulf uh, and with other uh, other uh, forces and uh, and uh, this was the, the, the initial attention uh, was uh, to prevent the expansion of the war uh, uh, referring to uh, the potential opening of a second front uh, in the north. Uh, at that at that point, Israel uh, was not interested uh, in a full scale war with uh, Hezbollah. It wanted to focus only on Gaza. But uh, there were some debates in Israel whether or not this is a smart idea. Hezbollah mm -hmm. uh, has been firing on a daily basis against uh, Israeli citizens as well as military positions. Uh, this is what we call uh, uh, low intensity warfare. Uh, and uh, the United States was concerned about uh, intensive, uh, 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 higher, higher uh, intensity uh, warfare. Uh, and um, so, uh, so, the, the, so uh, the debate uh, in Israel uh, ended with a decision uh, to focus just on, uh, on Gaza. Uh, obviously, uh, the Hezbollah threat uh, is is oh, is similar to the one that Israel has faced Gaza uh, because uh, it has uh, the Rad One uh, uh, commando units deployed in southern Lebanon in flagrant violation of uh, not of uh, UN Security Council uh, uh, resolution one seven o one that ended uh, the second war in Lebanon. So uh, there are some uh, talk in Israel about, uh, about going against Hezbollah uh, after, uh, after liquidating Hamas. Some people say that liquidating Hamas would send a message uh, to, to Hezbollah not to mess with Israel. Uh, and there are some talks about the diplomatic move through United Nations and maybe other nations to move the Radwan forces deployed in South Lebanon Beyond the Litani River, uh, to the north, uh, to the north. So far, uh, Hezbollah has uh, threatened Israel, but used um, used um, the force it has been using was minimal. Uh, I think that Israeli the Israeli military response was quite intensive, and I think that uh, if American deterrence uh, failed, and Hezbollah. Uh, under instructions from Iran, would expand the war somehow. Uh, United States will intervene in in, in certain ways. Uh, it could easily intercept uh, drones and and missiles and rockets and even uh, destroy the places from where they are launched. Uh, because just to maintain its its credibility, 
So I think the U.S. deterrence on this issue is, is quite intensive. But uh, if Israel decides uh, to go against uh, Hezbollah uh, after, after uh, achieving the goal in Gaza, uh, uh, this may create uh, uh, some kind of uh, disagreement with the United States. Okay. Um, There's a question here about the, going back to the hostage question uh, from Jacqueline, who she she suggests that um, that Hamas will drag out the hostage release as long as possible and keep, you know, keep this process going of adding, you know, another day and then another 10 people um, until, she says, until the only hostages left are our so our soldiers, our IDF soldiers, um, and then Israel at some point will resume the war. And she asked whether whether there'll be might be a problem with the U.S. going along with this. That maybe the U.S. will at this point be there'll be so much international pressure or public pressure from it with from within America that America will actually object to Israel going back into full hostilities in Gaza. So. Uh... Uh, point number one is that this is exactly uh, Hamas's strategy. Uh, Sinwar thinks that he could survive the war and still control Gaza. And uh, so he is saying it, Hamas's leaders abroad are saying it, uh, and uh, it's very clear that uh, the United States and Israel agree. Uh, they understand that this is uh, Hamas's strategy and uh, and and, uh, and the two countries have to deal with it. So, uh, first of all, there is agreement between the United States and Israel uh, to complete the initial phase of uh, releasing the hostages, women and children. And after that, I think that if uh, Israel were uh, would lose its patience mm -hmm. and uh, decide to resume a full-scale war against Hamas, I think the United States would not stop it. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think it's important because I don't know about the international community. And I hear all kinds of nonsense from people who are saying, uh, yes, we agree that Hamas should be removed from Gaza, but we also think that a permanent ceasefire should be established. And uh, yeah, I wonder, that this, is a, this is a contradiction in terms. And they don't, those who make these kind of statements don't even understand what uh what they are saying what they what is uh the uh the outcome of what they are saying but i think that as long as the united states and israel agree that hamas has to be removed and as long as hamas believes it, uh, it could survive then uh a full-scale war has to be resumed yeah. and i think the time for it would be after completion of that phase of releasing all the women and children. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, a uh, question here about uh, Iran, and specifically, this is from Shmuel, who asks about the impact on the Israel-US relationship of the growing relations between Iran and Russia. Um, uh, and obviously, we see that in Syria in particular, of course, but more broadly, I guess. And he 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 got he further asks whether the United States may try to develop relations with Iran, um, perhaps to counter that, or or if that's something that Israel needs to worry about. That is that the, the United States could actually try and develop to sort of get have a closer relationship or a better relationship with Iran at Israel's expense. I don't think that uh, I have not heard any uh, thinking. Uh, uh, on that, uh, on that um, potential strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, I think that um, uh, Iran's um, alliance with Russia, uh, the uh, the supply of uh, Iranian weapons, uh, and also uh, the the Russian uh, supply of weapons back to Iran. Uh, and um, so, so uh, Russia and Iran uh, and, and China have uh, have a, a, a common goal, and that mm. common goal is uh, to 
limit U.S. influence uh, in the international arena. Uh, they would like the United to, to evict the United States from the Middle East. This is what they want to achieve. Mm. I cannot see how, uh, how any negotiation with Iran. Biden offered Iran so many incentives, so many concessions during those stupid negotiations in Vienna over the nuclear deal. And still Iran, uh, Iran refused uh, to accept those concessions. I cannot see any uh, additional uh, concessions uh, that the United States may offer uh, Iran. I think that Iran uh, has been aligning with Russia and China not, not to, uh, uh, not to, uh, to gain more concessions from the United States. They joined the Russia-China alliance because uh, they fit with their dictatorships and autocracies and uh, common goal of, of uh, limiting uh, not only the, the American, but also the Western influence in the world. It's like a, it's like a new Cold War. Uh, between Russia, China, Iran, uh, North Korea against the West. And so I cannot see, and it would be very stupid uh, for the United States uh, to, to try to, uh, to bring Iran, uh, to, to, take, to extricate Iran from uh, the Russian orbit. I think, I think the alliance between Iran and Russia is, is, pretty, is pretty strong. I don't see any reasons Iran would uh, withdraw from that alliance. I don't see any concessions the United States can offer in return for an Iranian withdrawal from the Russia-China uh, uh, alliance. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, we're swinging. We're swinging to in between topics here a little bit. Um, uh, there's a question here from Linda Levine, which I think is actually a question that probably a lot of people um, would be thinking about, in, especially Americans who care about Israel, is um, what do you think Israel's relations will be with the Democratic Party post Biden? OK, so uh, so what we see uh, in the Democratic Party, we see some tension uh, between uh, those who call themselves progressives. I don't think they are progressives. They are regressives. Anybody who supports Hamas, and I'm making a distinction between Hamas and the Palestinians, you right. can support uh, the Palestinians. But when you say, when you say that uh, you support Hamas, then you are not progressive. And so uh, there are the, the, the group that you, the squad that you mentioned earlier, mm. uh, they are very hostile to Israel. Uh, some of them are anti-Semitic. Uh, they are a lost case. Uh, I think that uh, Biden is handling uh, OK. Uh, they made a few threats or some of them made a few threats you now to vote for him, which is which is very strange. Uh, the Muslims, uh, especially in places like uh, Michigan, in Michigan, uh, there are one one hundred and fifty thousand Muslims uh, in the last elections. Biden won uh, Michigan by. 150,000 votes. So the Muslims are telling Biden, if you do not stop your support for Israel, we are not going to vote for you and you're going to lose Michigan and other places. I believe this is an empty threat because if they don't vote for Biden, uh, there's a chance for a Republican, uh, could be Trump. And if Trump is reelected, then he said, no, even a single Palestinian would be would be admitted to the United States, and everyone who would support Hamas, I'm going to expel him from the United States. So, given this choice, I think these kind of threats are problematic. Uh, so, um, so I also see some split inside uh, the progressive branch hmm. of uh, of the Democratic Party. Uh, they, some of them ha have been uh, truly shocked by Hamas's atrocities. They are less critical of Israel. They are critical of Hamas. And the more extreme uh, part uh, of the, the more extreme part of the progressives, I think that AIPAC, uh, 
uh, is, uh, is mobilizing resources uh, to defeat some of them. Uh, and the only way to do it would be to win, to defeat them in democratic primaries because they represent those who, uh, who are progressives uh, in the House of Representatives uh, come from a heavily democratic uh, districts. So, so uh, the, the, the chance would be uh, to defeat them in democratic primaries. Uh, and I think that uh, it, this would require careful planning. Uh, APAC will have to calculate uh, where it could work and what, where it would not work and how to achieve this goal. But I think that those who, um, who really were extremely anti-Israel, uh, uh, then they should, should be isolated and maybe defeated next elections. And, and what Israel uh, also has to do is to strengthen uh, those in, in, in Congress uh, that support Israel. Uh, there are many Democrats who, who support Israel and increase that uh, rift uh, between the anti-Semitic and anti-Israeli members of the House and, and other, the other Democrats. Still, yeah. most, most of the Democrats uh, belong to the mainstream uh, of the party and are, support, are supporting Israel. Uh, the minority uh, belong to the progressive branch. Right. Um, there's a question here from Graham, which which alludes to something that you something that you mentioned right at the beginning when you talked about the um, the day after the war and the potential for disagreement between Israel and the United States on what that would look like, what Gaza would look like, um, who's in charge, um, and Graham suggests you know will it will it be the Palestinian Authority will it be Israel will it be some some other combination of states so how how does the US see it and how does that differ from what Israel sees the United States uh, has said that it wants uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, to restore uh, uh, governing of Gaza which was the case until 2006 uh, 2007 when Hamas uh, kicked out the Palestinian Authority from Gaza by force. Uh, and uh, Biden used, uh, he, he used the phrase um, like, uh, uh, like uh, re re reintegrated, um, changed the Palestinian Authority. Right. Never, explained, never explained what that, what that meant. Right. And, and um, uh, and then uh, every time they speak about the war, they also talk about uh, going back to the uh, two state uh, for two people solutions mm. solution. And uh, Israel says uh, that, first of all, we have to remove Hamas. So this is not a good time to uh, talk about uh, the future of, uh, uh, of a replacement and Israel does not deal at all with the with the two states uh, solution. I think that uh, that I would say uh, I've written about it. I, I would say that I would not reject uh, the Palestinian Authority, although I don't see much differences between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. They they have the same goals. Uh, they differ on on use of terrorism, but I think that uh, of all the options that are being circulated, this one may be uh, the least uh, bad or the least worse, uh, but Israel should suggest conditions. Yeah. Uh, uh, like I have, I have a, a long list of conditions and then obviously they would reject those conditions and, and the ball would be in their court. And I don't know what the United States is going to do in this case. Yeah. There's one thing I want, there's one thing I want to emphasize. I think the, the Biden administration is mixing or is mistaken in assuming that the Egyptian model of peace after the Yom Kippur War of 1973 would apply to Gaza. Mm. Uh, the model says that after Yom Kippur, both Israel and Egypt got hurt and opted for peace 
Yeah. I think that there's a there's a huge difference uh, between the situation there and now. Yeah. And if anybody thinks that this could happen after the complete failure of Gaza as a model for peacemaking, uh, the two state the two states uh, for two people solution is like uh, like a uh, like a, uh, a vision uh, that will have to wait. Uh, a few more years until mm. the Palestinians prove that they really want peace, peace with Israel. Yeah, I, I just, I actually, as it happens, I actually um, wrote something to myself very recently in which I made the point that if the people calling for two states now think that the think that the Israelis are going to be persuaded to withdraw from the West Bank after after Hamas, <laughs> you know, after Hamas came out of Gaza. And did what they did on October seventh. Then it's they're living in some sort of fantasy. Um, yeah. So let me let me just go back to uh, we're, we're we're nearly at the end, but I, I want to sort of get your your view on this, which is that going back to American politics, and um, we talked a little bit about the Democratic Party, but obviously um, the election is is coming in a year, and it looks like barring something unusual. That it will be Trump as the as the Republican nominee. Um, do you get a sense that the Israeli leadership? Uh, I mean, obviously, who knows who the Israeli government will be then? But let's say it's something similar to what we have now. Um, do you think they would want to? They would basically sort of be hoping for a return to Trump, given that Trump was, you know, so uh, seen as so so supportive of Israel, pro-Israel in all kinds of ways and moving the embassy and the and pulling out of the Iran deal and was in sync with Netanyahu in all kinds of ways. Um, or to put a you know devil's advocate, that there might be some concern that because he's so unpredictable, um, that that could that maybe it's better to stick with Biden, who at, at least we know that on a personal level, at least he has a deep support for Israel and a, and a, and a strong affinity with Israel. We are very good in analyzing the past, very mediocre in understanding the present, and very poor in predicting uh, the future. Uh, one year from now uh, in the Middle East is, is like 10 years elsewhere. Okay. Uh, so it's very difficult to say, but uh, obviously um, uh, uh, Israel should be concerned uh, if Trump were to win, uh, the problem would be that he is inclined uh, to support the axis of evil, Russia, China, Iran. Uh, so, and, and Biden does exactly the opposite. So, uh, so his global view uh, it could be problematic. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't know, if, uh, I, I assume that uh, uh, after the war, there would be another government in Israel. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know, I don't think that Netanyahu uh, is going to be able to uh, continue after that uh, spectacular failure on October 7th. Uh, so even even if the war succeeds and Hamas is destroyed, uh, so different Israeli governments, hmm. I don't know about um, about uh, President uh, Trump's second, uh, second uh, term, uh, Trump, uh, from the beginning of this uh, of the of the of the, this war, somehow he praised Hezbollah. He criticized uh, he criticized uh, Netanyahu. Uh, he still has that complaint about uh, about Netanyahu. Why he why he uh, why he called uh, Biden and congratulated him right. on on winning the elections. He thought that Netanyahu should have not done that. Uh, and and also he's a little bit angry at Netanyahu for undermining his uh, uh, his uh, uh, spectacular uh, peace plan right. uh, of 2020. And he is, as you said, very unpredictable, very problematic, especially in foreign affairs. He wants the United States to uh, to get out from uh, from the world. America first means uh, some kind of a splendid isolation. So, uh, so no, no, I don't think uh, there are certain things in, in United States-Israel relations that are going to continue. 
the Republicans obviously are much more supportive of Israel than the Democrats. Right. Uh, all kinds of uh, surveys have shown that. But uh, uh, Trump, it's a different story. Yeah. And I think that uh, that if he were to win, uh, there could be some um, differences uh, between the United States and Israel uh, on, on regional issues. Mm. Like a, a more mainstream Republican like a Nikki Haley would probably be preferable, right, in that regard. Yes, uh, yeah. but the question is whether the United States is ready to accept uh, a women president. Uh, th this is something that, uh, and uh, Trump is unlikely uh, to select her as a candidate for vice president, but I'm quite uh, impressed by uh, her rise uh, to the second place uh, yeah. among, among, among Republican uh, contenders, and uh, I, wish, I wish her much luck. Right. Um, let me ask this. We haven't we haven't touched on this at all. Um, the what, one of the ways in which the 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 relationship with the United States is obviously is so different from the relationship with any other country, of course, is the presence of the largest by far Jewish uh, diaspora community in the United States in, in, in the United States. Um, can you speak to that and, and how the war, in your view, has changed attitudes of American Jewry uh, towards Israel, and maybe also touch on the the rise in anti-Semitism as well. Yes, uh, this is still uh, uh, ongoing, so it's hard to tell uh, where it will be moving. But uh, um, the American Jewry uh, has been shocked, both by Hamas's atrocities as well as by uh, the waves of anti-Semitism in the United States uh, that, um, that rose by, I don't know, 1,000% uh, from, uh, from uh, the day of atrocities. Uh, they, uh, they, they have seen uh, Amer American universities uh, refraining from condemning Hamas from allowing uh, pro-Palestinian Muslim uh, Muslim violence uh, on campus, intimidation, and um, uh, of of especially of Jewish students and Jewish faculty. So uh, so uh, uh, it seems that perhaps um, uh, after several years of tension uh, mm -hmm. between uh, uh, Israeli government and American Jewry, uh, attributed. Uh, to Netanyahu, uh, as well as to internal divisions uh, inside uh, American Jewry, and as well as in, in the Democratic Party, because many Jews uh, in the United States, 70% of the Jews are, are Democrats, yeah. are liberals. Some of them are very anti-Israel, very anti-Zionist. Uh, I've been shocked uh, to hear uh, an organization, an uh, ugly organization, a terrible organization like Jewish Voice for Peace mm. on campus praising Hamas, what kind of Jews they are. And, uh, and, um, and if not now, another terrible Jewish organization, anti-Zionist, yes. anti you don't want to support Israel, fine, but you support Hamas mm. and you consider yourself liberal and progressive, you are garbage. And uh, maybe uh, it's about time that American Jewry begins to understand who is the enemy and how to fight that enemy in the United States. And the demonstration in Washington last week, uh, many people praised that demonstration. Uh, I was not that enthusiastic about it. I think that American Jews should have demonstrated in Washington much earlier and mm. bring to Washington 1 million people, not 250,000 or 300,000. Because mm. this is uh, this is an issue. Uh, it's not just support for Israel. It's uh, anti-Semitism, worst anti-Semitism uh, in American history. Uh, that uh, that was underground all the time. We have seen that all the time. But uh, American uh, Jewish organizations and the American Jewish left completely ignored anti-Semitism anti of the left. For them, right. anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, ex exists only with the American right. Yeah. And maybe maybe this is the time for them to wake up 
mm-hmm. and take actions uh, to to minimize, uh, reduce uh, the poisonous influence, especially on young Jews, young people uh, on campuses uh, across the United States. Thank you. I did hear a smart suggestion that uh, JVP should, rather than being Jewish Voices for Peace, should be interpreted as Jewish Voices for Pogroms. Um, yeah, um, that's a good idea. Um, so um, I think we will we will uh, finish there. And I want to thank you very much, Professor Gobar, for joining us. I apologize for the for the um, uh, technical problems. And to everyone, um, we we for for almost the entire lecture, we were able to see your face. There were a couple of moments where we where you slipped out, but we we got to hear your your very wise and uh, informative and instructive words. So I thank you very much for for joining us and for enlightening us. Um, I want to tell the audience we will be having a bit of a break from this series because of Hanukkah. We'll be back with this series with with the, with the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security um, in about a month. But next week, we have a different Zoom where we'll actually be dealing with one of the topics that we just discussed, which is the anti-Semitism uh, and anti-Zionism on American and British and other campuses. Um, so that'll be next week. So look out for that on our website or Facebook page. But email me at uh, paulg uh, at begincenter.org.il. I just put the, that in the, in the chat. If you want to join the mailing list, you can email me for that. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope those of you in Israel are staying safe and uh, uh, at least um, at least feeling some of the, I know it's it's a slim pickings at the moment, but some of the good news that is coming in of, of our hostages returning and seeing some of those amazing pictures of families being reunited. Um, and uh, yes, I thank everyone and hopefully see you again soon. And thank you again to uh, Professor Eitan Gilboa. Bye. Thank you.